listening to episode 55 of the Daily Growth Discipleship Podcast. I'm Chris Lamberth. And I'm Josh Havens. And we're on a journey to learn what it means to live a lifestyle of discipleship. We're glad you're joining us and hope that as you set aside this time for God, that he would help you grow today in the everyday moments of life. Today, we're talking with Dr. Kevin Folk. Kevin serves as an international missionary committed to advancing discipleship and training around the world. Through their strategic worldwide network of Globe University, he teaches and trains emerging national leaders to reach their local context and beyond. His focus and speciality is the Spanish-speaking world, including Latin America and Spain, although he also partners with local ministry educators and Bible schools in Africa, Asia, and Europe. If you want to create a lifestyle built around following Jesus, you need to also have a willingness to learn. In this episode, Kevin challenges us with his contagious passion for learning and spiritual development. If you've ever felt like you aren't good at learning new things, Kevin's down-to-earth approach will inspire you and, hopefully, relieve some of the pressure as you learn to be a student of Jesus. Kevin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. Really great to finally have you on. I've been wanting to talk with you on our podcast for a while. We've been friends and man, we have learned, you have taught me so much over the last like nine years. It's been nine years since we've worked together. That's pretty crazy to think about. And um, in, I think that nine years, our time together has been extremely transformational for me. I've learned a lot. We have wrestled with deep theological issues and, um, you know, learning about, education and and we're both very passionate about teaching and and helping students learn um but what led you to education in the first place you're now the dean of the undergrad school of bible and theology like you know you're starting to get cool titles and things like that but what first uh led you into this uh vocation yeah so i I wish i could say a plan then but i didn't so it kind of happens when you those of you who've done an MDiv, Chris, you've done it. You understand. There's a lot of implications from getting an MDiv and consequences. But one of those consequences when you're done is you realize you're not sure what you want to do. So when you're not sure what you want to do, you just go work for a school down the street. And in that process of working for this school, getting into missions, you discover that you just love education. So I kind of backed into it by accident. Never, I would say, outside of teaching. I would never pursue any kind of administrative role. That's just not smart. And so, you, you know, I think that's the best way to get into it uh, because it takes a lot of leadership, growth, maturity, which, frankly, I'm learning on the job as I, as I go. But that, that's what led me into it. You know, an interesting question, when I was in Spain, so that was my first term in missions, spent in southern Spain at the Bible school. I remember my second year there, reflecting in a hermeneutics class with my students and and they were asking me questions like why why are you in missions why are you a missionary what are you doing and it's the first time I really began to understand what my calling was see I thought my calling was to be a missionary I think what I've discovered is my calling is to teach and to be involved in formation and education I just happen to do that in a missionary context so that that's kind of been formative for me over the last 12 14 years how did you come to that realization that your calling was to teach, not to be a missionary? You know, I think I realized that in the first year or so on the field when you arrive and people would say, what are you going to do now that you're here? And I had to answer, I don't know. You know, I, I, you know you, you, there's a million things that you could do. <clears throat> Circumstances arose in a place where the Bible school had just for the first time had a, uh, appointed a leader of the school a native Spaniard. And so they were putting the school into the hands of, of the national church. And so I just remember meeting him and we really connected and kind of by, you know, by faith saying, Hey, I'm a new missionary, but we're going to move down to a city in an entire province where there are no other missionaries. And we're going to work completely with, with the national church and their school ministry. And it was kind of out of that in teaching that I discovered one day I was beginning to realize that I can't believe somebody would give me, you know, even a dollar. They wouldn't have to for me to go and share with students what I'm learning and studying on my own time. Like, I don't know. I just, I found that to be 
something I would do for free <laughs> anytime all my life. So that's kind of how I discovered it. Were you born with this natural desire to learn and study, or did this come about later in life? Well, I do remember back in elementary school, I loved to read. I was in a book more than anything. I would prefer books over people any day of the week when I was younger. I wish I could say that's changed, but probably hasn't changed too much, although I do appreciate being with some people, like you, Chris, occasionally, maybe five minutes a week. Appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I've always had a desire to learn and to know truth. And I think you guys can relate to this. That is a blessing and maybe a bit of a curse in there. You know, uh, it leads to a lot of dark nights. But it, for me, it's almost unquenchable. I wish I could say that at 45, I feel like that's diminished, but it has not at all in any way. In fact, I have more questions now than ever. I wish I could spend uh, decades in a library just reading what's been written on certain topics just to come to understand. So I, I don't know. I, I guess I had a desire to read, but the desire to learn, I did think, came later because I was not a good student mm. until later in junior high, uh, high school. So, yeah, you've mentioned a couple interesting things there. I want to I want to follow up with because again, like you a few decades spent in a library just reading and learning things. Again, I think for a lot of people that's unrelatable or at least they probably have some idealized version of that where it's like, "Oh yeah, maybe that would be cool or maybe there's other people who are like, "Man, why would why in the world would you ever want to spend that kind of time there?" So, I think there's there's one layer to that. But then the other layer, though, that you just said is it's difficult to do this sort of learning. Like you're having sleepless nights. And again, I think for people who don't understand um, what it is to have this sort of drive to continue to learn, they don't understand what that kind of a dark night of the soul is that you've just said. So because, again, there's a conception out there that if you're learning stuff, you must be adding. And if you're adding to yourself, that means you're getting better. You're becoming more and more confident. But kind of what you just said, the implication is the opposite. The more you've learned, the less sure you are about a certain topic or subject or maybe all of life. Wasn't it Einstein who said that as we discover more knowledge, the the understanding of how much knowledge is left that we don't know actually increases? Yes. And so it's kind of like as you shine a spotlight, if it's a very, very narrow point, the circumference around that light is quite small. But as the light grows, the circumference also grows. And so... I don't know. I find that in my own life where the more I look into a certain topic, the more I look into my own life, my own heart, the deeper the hole just seems to get. And I think that's for me, at least part of the cause of the dark nights is it just feels like you can't, like, like there's no end to, to this thing. And you have this desire to keep going deeper and deeper, but the deeper and deeper you go, the more you feel like this is never going to end. That's right. So why do you have that desire to keep going deeper if you have experienced pain in the past from it and you're quite certain that there will be pain in the future? <laughs> What's the thing? Why do it? Right. That's a good question. That's true, Josh, what you said as well. You know, it's much better to think you know everything in one aspect. You'll sleep well. You'll probably be pretty happy, which in our culture is like a really high value, which that's not a value for me, but it's a value for many people. Uh, but I guess that you learn to value truth. So truth is different than knowledge and wisdom. So tr seeking truth, you, you know, to use the parable Jesus gave, you know, for the kingdom, like you sell it all, right? You're not, the pearl is not the kingdom in that case. You know, the, the idea of the kingdom there is that you're willing to give it all, right? You're willing to give everything for that. I think that, I think there are those of us who are, who have that, um, I call it, I call it a, a bent that way. And I, and God uses us, can use us in the church. He needs us. I mean, think about, think about the people that we lean on. Even people who are blatantly anti-intellectual will quote from C.S. Lewis the next second, right? G.K. Chesterton. N.T. Wright. I, it, there's a complete paradox there. Uh, you think of Paul, the Apostle Paul. Can't hold a candle. Can't hold a candle to the things that he talked. We still, still can't understand some of the arguments that he was unpacking, but yet God chose him specifically. It wasn't an accident. Like, oh, oh, he happens to be a smart guy. Boy, I'm so glad that worked out. No, specifically, this guy was 
chosen out to say, hey, you think you're doing a good thing? You're a great zealot. You know, you have the equivalent of what? What do they say? You've got the equivalent of three doctorates. This guy was a mind like no other. And so, you know, Jesus says, hey, you're going to work for me now and you're going to suffer. And he not only suffered, I would argue, he not only suffered in body and for sharing the gospel, he also suffered because of what the truth that he tried to bore into over and over again. It led him to a lot of pain with his own people and with the pagans. So he, he couldn't win either way. But yet, uh, I think in there is maybe the reason that you keep going for that. You go because you get a dark night of the soul. And there are some times, though, you have to pull away. There are some times that I, I close the books, turn off the Kindle, and I'm like, you know what? I need a period where I have to stop. It's got to simmer. I'm deconstructing, and now I need to reconstruct. And I think God's in that process. I think God is literally in that process, and he's building us body, mind, soul, and as we build up again and he's deconstruct, helped us deconstruct and reconstruct through these voices, we then can come out of that dark night with a different perspective. And hopefully it's transformation. If it's not, well, then you've got to go back in. You've got to go back in again. And so that should lead to different thinking, living and embodiment. But um, I think that's that's the transformation that you have to keep in front of you. And just to clarify, when you say deconstruction, reconstruction, you're talking about deconstructing preconceived ideas and and and, and really in, in a very real sense, deconstructing who you thought you were, your identity is literally beginning to change. Um, and, and, and I think like in, in my own life is you know, we've talked about this and dealt with diff- difficult issues, you you go through these periods where, and, and, and oftentimes in one of these, like where you have to step back and allow the Holy Spirit to reconstruct you, you find that like a lot of times that's happened like over a weekend where you can finally get away from things and maybe have some quiet time, especially for us as introverts, we need that time to, that's where our deep thinking and deep reflection comes from for us. Um, that like you can show back up on a Monday and you feel like a completely different person. Like it, it seems like such a tiny thing and in, in, in certain, like I feel like I've just undergone one of these actually just uh, like what last weekend where I feel like 10% of me completely changed in one weekend. And now again, it's like 10%, but fu- 10% of a change to a fundamental way that you perceive the world is actually massive, massive. Cause then it starts to bleed over into everything else that you've. Yeah. Like, if 10% of your lens changes, then that 10% helps you look at the 90% very differently as well. Absolutely. Again, because it's all connected. There's not just a, a way that you look at this topic or that topic. When you And I, and I think this bears true in your life. Um, when you begin this lifelong learning, lifelong journey of learning, you realize that everything is integrated. You begin to see that there's these connections to one another. Okay. Before I get ahead of myself and start asking questions, I wanted to ask though about your routine. Like, how do you know that you're coming up against one of these periods of you've been overly deconstructed, you've taken in too much information and you need to step back and start trying to like Josh and I use the analogy. You've got to let the cement dry. You've been pouring in water and water and water. That's all this knowledge. And so now you've got this nice soupy mix of concrete and it's just you can't stand on that, man. You can't do anything. So you got to let it set. Otherwise, you just feel like you're just going to, your brain is going to come out of your ears. How do you, how, for you, how do you know that you're at that time? And then what is your routine for actually, you know, stepping back and, and doing some of that reconstructive work with the Holy Spirit? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I think some of it comes from, I, I tend to be a voracious reader, almost obsessed. I can, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I can go through a weekend where if I, need, if I need to know about something, I can rip off a few books. And I don't know, circumstances come together. And when it begins to break, break me, I think, I think for me, what it, how, it, how it manifests is it manifests in the, way, <laughs> in the way I start kind of behaving. You know, I begin to become grumpy. I don't sleep well. I mean, everything is beginning to get disconnected. I'm finding myself, usually I find myself to be critical and negative. So in that moment, what I'll do, I've le- and I've learned this over time. I really wish I could have known this younger, at a younger age. But so I'll step back, I'll turn off some of these things. And what I, I'll tell you one thing I've learned recently, and I'll tell you who's helped me with this big time is Dallas Willard. 
So what, what I've really learned is kind of to step back and I'll go into a moment for me of solitude. That's the biggest thing for me. So complete solitude. At, during those times, I can't even necessarily read. Like I like to, I, I like to read, right now I'm reading through the Psalms following the Book of Common Prayer, you know, evening and morning prayers. I can do that in the good times, but in the other times I have to turn it off. So I'm in silence, I'm in solitude, and it, it's prayer, but it's a different kind of prayer. And so I just have to walk a period and allow that to deconstruct. I do think, you know, it's allowing your brain to work, you know, make connections, work out. And of course, God's in that. You, if you believe that God's in everything, you believe it. If you don't, well then, you know, I'm not sure you're talking about the same Christian walk we're talking about, right? But he's in there in that very process, right, of, of those, those connections building. And so I think the, the, the biggest things in there are silence and solitude for me, contemplation. Now, during those times, as you can think, you can imagine implications from what I'm saying. Certain activities tend to be difficult during, <laughs> during those times. But that construction then occurs and that transformation happens. And that transformation, though, is what we're looking for. Because the bottom line is we believe, we believe, most of us, that when we receive the gospel, that the gospel completely transformed us in every aspect of our lives. What we begin to realize as you walk is that we're lucky if it's 0.1 of a 0.1 of a percent. That's where we began, right? We received it by faith, but it has not been applied. So you've just entered your journey. I like how C.S. Lewis says, he says in, uh, I believe it's mere Christianity, he says, every decision we make, we're becoming more of a creature of heaven or hell, right? So you begin to understand, Dallas Willer gets into that as well, little decisions you don't have to fret over them. Oh, what's God's? It's, that's not the point. The point is when you make these little decisions, you're either making them walking through the kingdom, down the kingdom path, or you're making them walking down the path of the world, right? You And we begin to find out that we've adopted all of these stories. I'm a product of the 80s. There's all kinds of stories in my head. I, these things come out at different times, and I don't even realize that, that that narrative was running through there, or that idea was kind of connected, and I've... I've, I've created some kind of a strange, you know, s syncretistic connection between, well, I mean, that's what the Bible verse says, but I've connected it to some other thought. And so God, by the Spirit, He deconstructs that. But it's, you know, I wish I could say it's magical, but it's not, you know, or it's instantaneous. It's not. It's progressive. It's painful. And funny enough, I think it's in The Dark Nights. Um, I'm trying to remember. I cannot pull up the book that this just, this just came through recently. But I just read a powerful passage from a writer that began to reflect on perhaps, and I think he was reflecting on the idea of pain, suffering in the world. Perhaps the most obvious way or the most normal way that God speaks to us in the world is through silence. Now that's something to think about. You know, there's, <laughs> there's a really powerful truth for learning in, in what you've just described. So many times we want to go, 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 always get more, always learn, always do something bigger and better. And we weren't designed to, to live like that. And so one of the things that hit me a few years ago was, you know, I, I felt always, at least growing up, felt this pressure. I got to read my Bible every single day. I've got to do all these things every single day. And for me, silence and solitude has been a huge relief in that area because I, just like you were describing, I, I find that I hit those seasons where I just have to turn that off for a bit and just be quiet. And it's in those quiet places that God does something incredible. All the stuff that I've consumed at that up to that point then is it has a chance to, to kind of germinate and grow and, and do something, not just like not just me putting the pieces together, but it actually starts to transform me in those times. And so when it comes to learning and, and this voracious desire for truth, we have to, I think, go and take it in seasons where we, where we consume and search and, and drive and desire, but then we also step back and let that just be. I think that's our way of actually allowing God and the Holy Spirit to be God and the Holy Spirit in our lives, because then it's no longer us just saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to achieve, I'm going to find the truth. You have to sit back and let the Holy Spirit do the growth work as well. Yeah, and it's, again, we've used this analogy before.
before, but it's it's a gym workout. It's a gym routine. Yeah. Where it's just for the mind. And we think that these things are different, that our spirits work different than our minds and our minds work different than our bodies. When really, again, Kevin, this is one of the things that we've learned over the past few years together and really, really become uh, to embody it is this idea that those things aren't separate. Mm -hmm. That we are one holistic being. Really, the the Hebrew sense of this idea, the word that they use is, is nefesh for soul. But it's it's an embodied existence that has all of those things being one. And so, of course, we need this sort of routine where, you know, you, you're pushing it really hard and you're trying to learn things. And, you know, especially if there's a problem that you're dealing with, like that's going to be a moment of intense learning. But then you also need to have moments of where you pull back and have intense rest as well and, and allow that stuff to really work itself into your life. Because again, if it's just knowing information, I mean, we could learn a lot of information. But if we don't take time to allow that information to soak in and become part of who we are, then it's not transformational. And really what we're after when we're talking about this sort of learning process is transformation. So one of the things I find interesting about this this process that higher education has obviously been a really big part of our lives together. I mean, it's it's been the thing that is that has really spurred us on and um and and, and really taught us how to learn. Mm-hmm. And so like again, I, I can't help but think your journey and, and what you're talking about here is you're really communicating why it is important to learn how you learn in particular so that you can uh, apply that. Because again, if you don't know those sorts of things, then you're going to miss out on the patterns and routines and the the proper rhythm that you need to set up. Again, that, that you've just got done you know, telling us like you, you notice when you start to become grumpy, when you start to uh, sleep less. And now those, those become your triggers. You, you have learned how you have learned. Um, so I guess the, the, the next question I really want to get at is why is it important for someone to learn how they learn? I mean, you've just demonstrated it in your story of where you're noticing your patterns and routines. And, and that has sort of been the way in which you know whether or not you need to either push harder and, and try to like go back to the gym, the mental gym, or you need to stay at home and, and have times of rest. How would you go about encouraging, let's say like an undergrad student or, or somebody who's maybe in uh, formal education and they don't maybe feel like they have those options available to them, uh, but they're still very much in that formative time period of learning how they learn. Mm-hmm. Well, let me give you an example of what I did. So this may sound strange to some of you, but when I was in, in a, when I was in my undergraduate at Wheaton College, I remember... <laughs> So the advantages when you're, you know, 18 and 22 is that you have lots of energy. I mean, I remember I could, I could go to class, I could study. I, I don't remember sleeping that much. And then, you know, you could play like you could rip out a four-hour game of tennis, you know, with your buddies. I don't know how we did that. I can't do half of that right now. But, I, but I do remember, I always had to decompress on Friday. So I had this weird routine, which I never thought about. I just thought it was a weird thing that I did. And if I didn't do it, I was going to die. You know, that's what I felt like. So I go back to my dorm room. Of course, no one's there on a Friday usually, you know, afternoon. And kind of like mid-afternoon, late afternoon through like the dinner hour or something or when we're, I was going to, you know, hang out with some friends. I would literally lay on my bed and just lay there thinking, didn't sleep, didn't talk, didn't read, just went through all the things I learned that week, interactions I had, and kind of, you know, put it together and reflecting on it. I just thought that was weird. I mean, honestly, I did, because I didn't know anybody else that really did that. But I, I learned later that I wish I, I wish I could apply that even more then. So, you know, you think of an undergrad student. You know, I know lots of time, there, well, there's two problems when, when you're an undergrad. Number one, you, you don't know enough of the world to really know how great it is that experience that you're going through. Now that really can't be changed, it's just perspective. But the other thing that makes it worse is you don't have good time management skills, most likely. So that just makes it worse, right, Chris? So if you planned your time out well, your learning would be much deeper. So, you know, by the time I got into like, you know, my MDiv and then, you know, some doctoral work, man, I knew how to do it and pace it better to where I didn't just get the assignment done, but I actually engaged in some transformational learning during the process. And I think for undergrad, 
especially for students who are maybe pursuing, you know, Bible theology, right? They're doing, they're doing that for a reason. They, maybe they want to go into ministry, but some are doing it because they want to know the truth. They want to get into it deeper. But learning the facts will not be enough. You'll get the grade. You'll get things done. You've got to wrestle with those points you hit in the course and the, th- and the moments you have where you're like, well, wait a minute. You know, like we talked about yesterday, if you're going through a synoptic gospels course and, you know, you get to a point of what is the gospel and you thought you could answer that and then you realize at the end of reading that section that you can't answer that. You didn't know that. You're not even quite sure what that is. And then all of a sudden it changes your whole view of the Old Testament. Wait a minute, I just thought this was this old, you know, crack, you know, crotchety book that I read. I didn't know what it meant. And I just, I just interpret allegorically. You know, who knows what you did with that? And all of a sudden it affects and breaks down your entire foundation. Now that I would submit to you is a recipe that if you dwell on that, it's a recipe for disaster in the course. You got to write the papers, you got to do your exam, but you've just stumbled upon what may be the most important part of that class, right? You just hit it. And so you better build in some time to go into that. And maybe you wait till the class is done. I don't know. I, I think that's difficult as an undergrad. It's hard for me even to reflect on that time and to be able to apply what I know now to that level. But I do know that we should value transformational learning though at every level. Because, and that's why you hear these complaints, right? We, we heard it, we, the three of us have our MDiv. And you get out, you know, we ran into some buddies. I remember having buddies I was in school with and they're like, I'm just so tired of school. I just need to get out and do something, you know? And I never related to that personally because I would have liked to stay in school longer just as long as I didn't have to have the stress of like working and taking tests, you know? And then there are others that get out and they say, well, I didn't learn that in seminary. Well, of course you didn't. You know, your, your goal there, it, their goal there was to kind of form your mind and for you to be able to reflect on theology and, you know, theories of leadership that were going to affect you in your life so that you could build some strong foundations. And if one of the foundations is the foundation of learning, right? Foundation of learning as a leader, right? You're not the guy given the answers. You may have an answer that came from a dark night, but most likely, you know, you'll get questions from your congregants and, you know, hey, so why did, why did Jesus have to die? You know, why do we have to read this, you know, Old Testament? You know, and you'll be like, well, let me, give me a couple weeks. I'll get back to you on that. I mean, that's what you find out. You're, you're not going to be the, you know, the, the guy up there giving out the answers. I realized that in the classroom. Now, you do realize also some basic stuff that you know in the classroom. I realized, you know, I was teaching one day uh, in Spain and I, I just mentioned, right, off, off the cuff, something about classical Pentecostals and something. And they were like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You think we don't know what you're talking about? And so I'm like, oh, you never heard these terms? And so I had to take, you know, 10 minutes and discuss terms. There's that part of it as well. But when they, you get into the questions that they really have, there's not like there's an answer that I can give that, right, Chris? Why do people suffer pain? Well, Chris, you know, I've got an easy answer for that. You know, that is, that's not the case. <clears throat> So, yeah, that's great. So there's two things that you demonstrate there is number one, we have deeply held assumptions that we're not always aware of. No. And so it is, it's funny those, and that's why I think this process, especially of like formal higher education is so valuable is because it exposes you to these ideas that you didn't even know that you had. Like no. they shine, they shine a light on it for in a very real way. And then they cause you to wrestle with it. And, and, and so like, and again, like you come across that question that you were mentioning, like, what is the gospel? That's a deconstructive moment. Yes. That's one of those moments where you realize, oh, wait a second. I wasn't as sure about this thing as I thought that I was. Yes. And then number three, or whatever order I'm in now, the process of education isn't to just know information. I think it's to it's to give you tools so that you can continue this process of learning and of communicating. And I mean, like, again, in an ideal world, then like, yeah, you, that would be that tool that you would carry around with you. Well, why does bad things happen to good people? And you could just like whip it out. But again, right. the more you learn about this process, the more you you realize how complicated of an answer that is. Well, it's got to be transformational. Yeah. That's the key for me because you can you can know something in your head and then regurgitate it and tell it to somebody. Mm-hmm. And that's those, those yeah. people who like to give those really just easy answers. Yeah. They think they have it figured out. It's really just in their head, though. Yeah. But the, and there's something really different about somebody who's processed it on a heart level and really had a transformational experience with what they've learned. There's this passion to what they're talking about. There's a, you, you can get a sense of the deep wrestling that they've had mm-hmm. as they've worked through this themselves. They're much more willing to say, I don't know. 
but they're also much more willing to not just give you an answer, but walk through the experience with you. Yes. And that, that just makes learning, I think, contagious. Well, that's, that's the process of discipleship, point. too. It is. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this was the thing I was going to mention earlier when you were talking about you, when you first get saved, you enter into this thing. And you said like a percent of a percent is the only thing that changes about you at that time. And that's not something to bemoan. Now, sometimes God, I think, does a, a great miracle in some of our lives mm -hmm. and we can get like, you know, 0.2 or 3 percent at a time. Oh, yeah. like, those are those are great incredible moments but it's also a reason why we should approach this idea of learning and following christ with such humility because we are all in this process and again i think discipleship gets at that process so much better especially than using um terms like salvation which is true right. we are saved but then again what are we saved from what are we saved to what do we do with that now and again all of those indicate, those kind of questions indicate this process of learning and this journey that we're on to be transformed. And no matter how much you think you know, you're missing something. And that's why you need discipleship. And that's why you need the community to walk with you because Absolutely. there are going to be the people that are like, hey, wait a second, Chris, maybe you're kind of missing it over here. Or maybe, maybe your idea doesn't quite line up and then I'm going to get all like, what are you talking about? You know, no, that's what the Bible says. I, I read it. You know, it says it. I believe it. And that's what it is. And you're like, yeah, but don't you think, you know, maybe the what happened, you know, or like you were talking about, Kevin, uh, product of the 80s. Don't don't you think that that thing that you learned a long time ago might be in? And you're like, oh, wait a second. You, right. And you put something together. Mm -hmm. Like now it's hard to come up with an example because, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're on the cuff. And then like once you. It, it, it's sort of funny. It, it, it's like once you're able to see something um, or like those patterns, right? Like you see those pictures yeah. that are, that could be two different things. Mm -hmm. And once you're able to see it one way, it's really hard to then switch back and, mm -hmm. and see it the other way. Mm -hmm. I, I, this is what I, I feel is like in that learning process of like you, you latch on to that where you lose your ignorance in something. Mm -hmm. It's hard to remember what it was like to have that ignorance in the first place. Yeah. So then you walk around and you're all hotty and oh, you're yeah. like, Hey, Oh, you know, I can't believe how stupid you are for believing that thing that I believed like last week. <laughs> well, for, <laughs> like, me, the classic, yeah, for me, the classic example of that is the documentary hypothesis. You get into yeah, yeah, yeah. like oh, a, your, yeah. your, your freshman level Pentateuch class oh, and you are all of a sudden exposed to this idea that the first five books of the Bible may not have been written by Moses. And maybe they were written over a period of hundreds of years. And all of a sudden you're like, wait, 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 just wait. I grew up knowing that Moses wrote these five books, even the part about himself and even the part after his death. That was just the way it was. <laughs> yeah, right. And then somebody comes along and says, well, wait, this, this may sound earth shattering at first, but what's that say about your understanding of scripture and inspiration and what God's actually doing in this text? Yes. Does this affect any of that? And, you, and, and as you walk through that, you start to realize, well, man, my understanding of what scripture is was kind of off before. Yep. I can't think of anything the same way again now. I can't look at the Gospels the same way because mm. now all of a sudden it's about the Holy Spirit doing the work in, in, in your life through the text and not you putting your faith in some uh, dictation theory of inspiration mm -hmm. where these people had to write it exactly this way in exactly these words. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you, you found out, you discovered that you put your faith in that process of the text, i.e. Moses wrote it, right? to realizing, wait a second, maybe my faith should be in Jesus who said, I believe that this is inspired in God's word. Who wrote it doesn't matter at that doesn't point. Doesn't matter at that if point. If you believe in Christ. But that's a tough thing to jump thing. to if you're learning it the first time. Which I did, and I and I do. I can remember yeah. that. So thanks for that, <laughs> you know, that, that illustration, because that was one of the first and most tough things that you learn, especially as a as an early student. You know how that flips you on your head too, because you got me thinking of my process in there too. So I, I go to seminary, and one of my first classes, you know, was hermeneutics with um, Dr. Hernando, who, whom I love. But man, that lit me up. So I wasn't coming from, you know, a, bi a Bible school background per se. But, you know, it turns, it turns you on your head because you, you, you deconstruct that, right? You learn the process of the canon, right? How the canon can't, and you're like, wait a minute. 
Now, that's not what I reflected on when I was five years old in, you know, Grace Bible Baptist Church, you know, in York Springs, Pennsylvania. Like, I, I just saw it floating down from head. I mean, I literally remember mm -hmm. daydreaming one day in, in church, and I'm like, this had to be the way. You know, and you see the process of the canon, but then that's step one. Step two, though, you realize, and here's the question that you would ask and you would ask others. So what's more miraculous, right, and more powerful, floating down this idea, you know, dictating it directly to man, or is the true miracle in the process of thousands of years, okay, of probably telling this story in an oral way and passing down through the people of God, and yet all through that, right? God works through human beings and preser pre or preserves his truth. All of a sudden, now you've got a ramp, an on-ramp to approach an un a better understanding of the incarnation, mm -hmm. right? Of a better understanding of why God works in history. Like, oh, that wasn't, oh, that's not an accident, is it? Oh, you know, God's like, oh, I messed up. I got to destroy everything, you know? And that, and you begin to, right? Everything is now on a new foundation. That for me, though, was mind-blowing, that the question could reverse that. Yeah. To where you think mm -hmm. at the instant miracle, is, is better than the progressive miracle. Maybe they're worth the same. So you bring up a really good point, and it's been another like major area of connection for us over the, the years, and, and, and that's this biblical theology. That's, that's essentially what you're talking about here in, in recognizing, I think, the process of this, although that's not included in the, like the technical study of biblical theology, but it's this realization of what God is doing in that story that you were just referencing. Um, how did you come to value biblical theology so highly? Yeah, so that, that for me was a journey that I, I'm trying to think, it was it better to say I backed into biblical theology? Maybe I fell into it, maybe I got stuck and I was walking along the path and there was this really nasty bog I stepped into and started sinking. <laughs> I don't know. But funny enough, that really came about. I mean, there was a journey there. When, when I was in Spain and teaching, and there were so many things going on. Okay, I'm, I'm living in another culture. Okay? I didn't visit. You know, I moved there, permanent re you know, became a resident. You know, and that's a whole other thing. We could do a whole multi-series podcast on that alone and, and what happened during that process and how that's changed me. But the other part was through teaching you know, I began to read, I began to have a desire, and some of it was the cultural context, because I'm there looking at the span. I'm inside in the Spanish culture as a foreigner, and I'm looking, and I'm like, this is unique, because you're looking at something very differently. And over time, though, I'm beginning to understand it a little better, you know, simple things, and I'm like, well, wait a minute, no. Oh. So you're approaching that this way, culturally speaking, I'm approaching it the other way, and then I began to put myself in that frame of mind, so that naturally led me, because I was doing some teaching in, obviously, Bible theology, to ask questions about the New Testament. What in the world was the background for this, right? What do some of these terms mean? I'm pretty sure it wasn't, despite, you know, my belief for a long time, you know, naive belief, I'm pretty sure it wasn't written in English, you know, in 1984, you know, thinking of the NIV translation, but... You know, but but that's what I may have thought before. This was translated. Okay, wait a minute. So what does this word mean? You know, I remember in, the, in my Greek class, I, I always tell students, I'm like, if you don't learn anything else in this class, please learn this, please. I, I beg you for the sake of your congregation, your future ministry, and for, for the people that you touch. When in doubt, go to the original. Please, you know, don't go to, you know, we would say Webster's Dictionary in English, right? You know, we see students do that from time to time to define a word, and we're like, but that's nice. You know, but there would be the, the Real Academica, you know, the, looking into their, their, their dictionary, but you go back into that. So it led me into asking questions about cultural background, and I began to read into that heavy. Now, funny enough, that very, that very reading led me to a very dark place. Very, very dark. Believe it, it did. It was a dark night. Darker than I've experienced before. So in the midst of all of that, I, I somehow stumbled through, through, uh, a class I had on biblical, I was missions theology, I don't remember what it was called, biblical theology and mission. And one of the, the instructors said, hey, here's a list of books, you should check these out. And among those books was Goldsworthy, you know, and some other ones, Goheen. I mean, these are, these are words that I throw out at anybody I meet because for me, these are books that you must read. Like, I honestly think you should read it. You hit high school and you're a Christian, you must read these books. Like, you must start to get, they're that approachable, you know, in terms of the reading, 
and and the writing, but they're that deep that this is something that needs to be start to put in your foundation from a young age and high school undergrad. But that led me into biblical theology where I was asking questions that I could not answer. Right? So as I got into the background of the New Testament, so what is the connection of this with the Old Testament? I couldn't answer that some, year, some years back. I mean, not even attempt to answer it. I was like, well, I don't know. You know, I'm, I like the minor prophets. You know, I think they're cool. You know, but I, I know most people I talk to don't. I remember in college I took a, I was debating on whether they're taking a class on the minor prophets or another class. And I talked to my youth pastor, whom I love, by the way. And, but I remember him asking, he, it, was a, it, was a, it was a question that would make sense if you'd hear it. He said, well, you're never going to preach from the minor prophets. He's like, so take this other class. And, and, and I heard the answer and, and I'm like, you know, that's kind of true, but that's the sad part. So I took the minor prophets class because I, 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 I somehow realized that, I, that we needed that piece. We're missing, if we're not preaching from it, then something's happening here. And so that was, a, you know, a, a, pr a previous piece that led me into that. But, but getting to biblical theology was really the question of, what is the background, right, of understanding the gospel? What, as I read the book of Matthew, I could never read it before and understand until I reread the Pentateuch, right, and Joshua. Then go back and read Matthew. Just, 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 just hover on there. Let, let your mind be like the mind of a first century, a good first century Hebrew, okay, Israelite who grew up in the synagogue, hearing the scriptures read constantly, probably had a much better memory than, we've, uh, than we have today. And all of a sudden you hear these things that Jesus was quoted as saying, or that Matthew is saying, and you realize, wait a minute, Matthew is really comparing Jesus a lot here to Moses, and in some ways to Joshua. And you read the Great Commission and you're like, Oh, this just wasn't some random thing, you know, at the end of, hey, now that I got you together, I died and rose again, you know, you need to go out and do some work. And all of a sudden you realize it's like, no, it's all of a sudden, this is a picture of Jesus saying, go into the world and conquer it, in a way, is what you're reading through there. And him saying that this is the, this is the proclamation that Moses, Joshua, is giving to the people. Now that you've been called to be the people, go conquer the entire world. Okay, you know, that's a different meaning, you know, that I had heard before. But that's where biblical theology comes in. I haven't unraveled it, but behind there is where that piece comes in: the arc of the story, that true story from creation to new creation. Which, honestly, speaking of transformational, that is transformational uh, learning that can happen through a basic, a basic understanding of that discipline that can reorient your entire life. Mm -hmm. I think it has mine. So what is biblical theology? You, you, you just were kind of hitting on the definition a little bit when you're talking about that arch from the beginning to the end. But like, what is biblical theology? And then like, how, maybe how is it different than what we would call systematic theology? All right. It's a good question. In fact, we were joking around before, like, you know, my, my, my answer, you know, my tongue in cheek would answer would be like, well, obviously it's. It's better than non-biblical theology. Like it's, you know, it's, it's real theology, but we wouldn't want anybody to think that when we use that term, like, oh, you're just talking about what the Bible says. Yeah. Mm, yes, but not what you mean, you know, kind of a thing. So I've got no original thoughts on this, none, right? For me, I am, I'm deeply, uh, I've been deeply uh, influenced by, by the, work, the writings of Goldsworthy, Graham Goldsworthy. And Michael Goheen, those are two that I've reread multiple times and helped me. But so biblical theology is looking at the scriptures and understanding the progressive revelation, right, of God's plan, right, from the beginning. And so I, you know, I'll use an example of, of a book I highly recommend. Everybody should read, and this is where you should begin in high school. In fact, my kids will begin earlier, but at, at the least in high school, okay, maybe have a few less parties and maybe have a you know, a, a Michael Goheen drama of doctrine party, okay, where you get in, you get into this text so that, that they can really understand the story. But he talks about the, the narrative in 6X, right? Creation, fall, Israel, the kingdom revealed through Jesus, the mission of the church, new creation. And N.T. Wright talks about 5X, whatever, it doesn't matter. Four, five, three, you know, Goldsworthy concentrates on four as well, or four, so you got four, five, six. But the point of it is to see this 
this progressive unveiling of revelation as God revealing to us over this long period, especially you know after the fall, and He call, you know calls Israel together. But you you see God's plan in that, and you see themes that Goldsworthy would, would talk about, right? These themes that are unpacked, right? He defines the kingdom as, in a, in a general sense, as God's people. Um, in God's place under God's rule, right? So you don't need to look for the word, you know, look for the word kingdom, you know, do your words that, you know, you're not, no, that's not exactly what we're talking about, although words can help you. But it's understanding these themes that develop, temple, land, people of God, right? All of these things that you see in the Old Testament, you see building through these epics, through these periods. And then I think the most valuable part of that, though, is what Goldsworthy really brings, and it's in his Christ-centered biblical theology or his gospel in the kingdom is he emphasizes that the proper interpretation though comes through Christ. So, which is an unexpected interpretation at times, right? It's not always a one for one. Like, Wait a minute. You know, but that if we believe this is, this is the, this is the foundation of a Christ centered biblical theology. If you believe that God revealed himself through Jesus, and that is the, the invisible God become visible. And that is the revelation, right? The, the scriptures test, the, that revelation testifies to the revelation who is the word come incarnate. If you believe that, then you believe that the interpretation of all scripture must be through him. That changes a lot. And so you can spend a whole life unpacking that. And that's, that's I think where the three of us, for instance, we're kind of in that vein trying to unpack those things. But that's a little primer, uh, I would say, on biblical yeah. theology. What the heck is this? I've never heard of this it's before. In the Something's rattling. I've never... It's, yeah, it sounds like it's coming from up there. Gosh. I don't know. It's annoying. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop it. Start. Yeah. I didn't bring my power cord in my 15%. I figured so. since you turned your screen like all Ooh. the way off that you were worried about battery. We, we'll go for about maybe 10 more minutes and we'll wrap it up. Okay. I think I think we're, this has been great. We could talk for a couple more hours though on this. This is just fun. This is fun. Again. This is what we do in our spare time. I want to have you on, like, I want to have you on like as one of those like semi-regular guests where we just sort of like talk about stuff and process and shoot the It'd be fun. Bull. <laughs> I guess it'd be fun like you just kind of record like the conversations we've already had. Exactly. Well, like yeah, we, we did like, that with Snavely yeah. uh, oh, uh, yesterday, Tuesday, Tuesday, one Mother month. Of this week has been weird. Oh, gosh, dude, this week. <laughs> Life goes by so fast. <laughs> Snavely blew all of our minds. Anyway, that it was fun. I just like catching up with you guys, and so I want to share that. Anyway. It's good. Basically, faculty need to do this and just release this stuff all the time. Yeah. It doesn't have to be oh, formal. By the way, that was my original idea behind these intensive videos. That's what I thought. Just to and, have a conversation. And then it became globalized. I know, I don't know why that is. Yeah, the, I'm I'm really glad to see that over the past few years, especially, like I think when I I entered college, the the real emphasis was still on systematic theology. And it was it was beginning to change. Biblical theology was really starting to uh, like rise up as a prominent field and area of study, but we were still stuck on systematic theology, which is, um, you know, breaking down, it, it's more like, I like to think of it as just topical, answering topical questions like, um, mm -hmm. is God sovereign? And so you would go through just different portions of scripture and you pick out scriptures that would support this idea that God is an, in fact, sovereign God. And so th I think that's an important thing to do that's good mm -hmm. to have. And that, in fact, aids our biblical theology in many ways because, again, then we can go through and we can look at the story or we can look at a particular author's perspective and we can create these, quote, biblical theologies, what the Bible, what this story actually says about, you know, any of these uh, particular, like, veins, like, like you were just mentioning, like, there's different authors will emphasize different periods of time to build a particular narrative of the biblical history. Um but but I love what you're saying here because the way like people will often ask right and I think this is the most transformational part of learning why should we learn any of this why should we go to school why do you do this seminary stuff 
And uh, I, I summarize it really well with what John Piper said one time. It changes your life to know. To know that all of Scripture is culminated in the person of Jesus Christ changes the way now that you go back and you read all of those scriptures. Again, the minor prophets, which as you read, and unless you understand some of that historical literary background, they mean almost nothing to you. Now at least understanding that Jesus fulfills those things, now you have a reason to to go and read them. Mm -hmm. Now you have a hunger and a thirst to go find out these odd seemingly obscure historical facts that, you know, to a lot of us in our everyday life, they're not going to apply directly or, but once you find out, because they're culminated in the person of Jesus Christ, they matter. Now they're going to change your life. And you just can't get that from a systematic theology. Exactly. Because Because then in systematic mm -hmm. theology, you're approaching it from you. You're looking at your own felt needs, your own questions, and you're approaching the text with you yeah rather than the other way around in which god's revelation approaches you in story Mm, and he's the one making the 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 change in your life you're not you're not going to him looking for something to just fill a void that you have all of a sudden he's coming to you with everything and saying i'm going to transform not just a little piece of you the one felt need that you have i'm going to do the entire thing your entire life and so it's not just well, I need to know that God's sovereign because uh, my mom just had cancer and and died, or uh, like in your case, Chris, my mom committed suicide. I, I need to know God's sovereign in this and that he still has this. And it's a good thing to know mm-hmm. in that moment because our pain is very real. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, a biblical theology that says God's had this plan from the very beginning and he's carrying it all the way to the end. And he's yeah. got a very... <laughs> an amazing purpose in mm-hmm. all of this, and that looks like Jesus. But to your point, it's not systematic theology that gives me comfort in that moment. It's right. the biblical theology that right. gives me comfort. Right. Because again, in, in fact, the systematic can cause us more problems because if God is sovereign, then God controls everything. Bad things happen. Why doesn't God stop them? That's yeah. a systematic progression. You that's, don't have the rest of the story. That, we don't have the rest of the right. story. Instead, if I start right. out with, I know God from the beginning of human history is working tirelessly to save the creatures whom he loves and that he has done that and he demonstrated how much he loved him in the person of Christ. And I have hope that the person of Christ is the ultimate answer because God raised him from the dead Mm -hmm. and he has promised to return and raise us from the dead. Mm -hmm. Now that is a story I can get behind. And my mom's death starts to make sense. Not that that she died, but why she died is because of sin, Mm -hmm. because of pain, because that is our curse to bear that Christ has come to save us from and set us free. Now, with that lens, if that's my lens, I'm being transformed. Now I can enter a place, I think, where systematic theology can help answer and aid in, in filling in maybe some of the cracks. Like, okay, like if that's the story... Well, I guess God might be sovereign. So this is what scripture talks about as far as sovereignty goes. Oh yeah, that makes sense because this is the biblical story that I'm that I'm familiar right. with, that, that yeah. I recognize. And I think systematic theology only makes sense when you have a biblical theological understanding of things. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You make me think about, Chris, what we've talked about several times, that if you're steeped in that story and you know the narrative and what God is doing through there in the person of Jesus, it's almost hard to approach that question the same way most do, mm. right? Why do bad things happen? If you really understand the fall and what circumstances we've woken up into, right? Like, uh, you know, think of Lord of the Rings, you know? Why in the world did I have to be born in these times? You know, and yeah. Gandalf is a great answer. Like, you don't choose your time. We, we didn't choose our times. We Some of the stuff that we're born into is just chaos and a mess. But if you understand that, I think too, I remember when I reread recently the book of Judges, I got done with that book and I'm like, oh. I mean, I just had to shake it off a little bit. And at the end of the book, I came out with too, how can anything good happen on this earth? Mm. Right? That's your question then. That's the question that, that the Christian may ask is like, you approach that, you're like, I don't know how anything good can happen. Of course, that leads you to Christ. You know, instead of how can anything bad happen? You're like, well, that seems pretty obvious. 
you know, G.K. Chesterton, you know, said, used to be common sense that, you know, we used to have a common sense understanding of sin, right? It used to be common sense, like things don't work out, like people get sick, people die, you know, nothing works out the way you want it to. You, know I mean? you run through all this list, Christian or not Christian, and so, you know, it's a little harder today. You know, Paul Golden is cultural apologetics says because we live in a disenchanted age. You know, now we've got to we've got to try to give people, you know, get people to a place where they can see some of the enchantment, you know, some of the magic, as C.S. Lewis would say, just to say, can you see this world at all? You know, can you see the common sense here? You know, and I think that helps. I think that helps to reorient it. Another thing I thought of, too, that you were talking about, which I think people would appreciate with Goldsworthy, if, if you get into some some reading some of his stuff on biblical theology. He came to this topic out of a desire to help people to be able to apply scripture in homiletics. Okay, you know what I mean? <laughs> to apply the truth to somebody's life. So, I mean, it's important. It, it does give you, it will give you a much different answer mm -hmm. than just, uh, you know, something naive that you understood or some pat answer. Or even something you get from systematic theology, which another thing too, systematic theology flows well out of biblical theology, mm -hmm. right? Out of, out of that core, it, it can feed back in, and it also flows into that, like you said. So, yeah. Um, one of our favorite questions we love to ask guests are, is, um, "What is the most valuable thing you've learned in the Christian life?" And to give you some time to think about that. The reason why we ask that is we found that there's, and we've been talking about them this whole time, right? There's these moments that you come to something, there's an encounter with Christ you have where once you have it, once you learn something, nothing can ever be the same. Again, that's what we've been talking about this whole time, this deconstruction, reconstruction idea. Um, one of our guests called them conversions. Mm -hmm. So we have a an initial conversion to Christianity, but then again, through our journey, we start with that 0.1%. And then we graduate and they continue to keep happening. Um, so I like that. We are continually converted and we give over pieces of ourselves to to, to Christ. But um, usually there's like one or two that really stand out as the most valuable. And uh, so, yeah, does anything come to mind when I ask that question? Yeah. So it depends on the, uh, you know, the time of life I've been in. But lately, lately I've had a, I've had an experience with that you know, a little conversion moment, you know, transformational moment through some, anyway, I've told you about it, Chris, but, you know, my strange reading habits, you know, bring together fiction, not fiction. <laughs> somehow, somehow in my head, it comes together to be a, you know, pretty decent picture at the end, you know, after some dark nights. But I think one thing for me that's been building for some time, but has really, really come home. And it, it's through a reflection, through kind of a, a darker, a darker moment I was walking in, you know, not so long ago. And, and reading, you know, hearing the voice of Dallas Willard, which if you haven't read Dallas Willard, try to jump into that. You know, I mean, it, it, it's like he's, you know, it's like he's speaking to you as a nice, you know, nice, nice pastor, nice father, you know, kind of bringing you through it. But I think is the view, and Josh, you made me think of this when you shared before about when we see our part in the story, right? Just what Goheen and they get into their book on biblical theology to give you the the story that we're part of and how that's not compatible with other stories. <laughs> there, there can't be two true stories, right? That's just, you know, we, we have a reason and we understand that that's not compatible. Um, but it's been building towards this idea of our Christian walk as embodied. And there's a lot you could talk about there. But it's something that's changed in the landscape in the past couple hundred years. It's just a slight tweak you know, slight adoption of some things that are not Christian, right? They're not Christian. They're cultural. Some of them are downright, you know, agnostic, atheistic paths. But somehow it just feels compatible because that's, that's what we hear when we can hear some scripture at times. But Dallas Willard helped with that too to understand. I began to ask questions when I walked through a dark time. And my question was, why, why, why don't I practice more of the spiritual disciplines? I know about them, right? We read... You know, the book by, um, help me out. Uh, Richard Foster. Foster, yeah. Celebration. Of, yeah, Celebration of Discipline. I mean, we, we took the spiritual formation class, but I never really followed up on that. And I began to reflect on even, you know, my experience in, in the community, in the body, in the church. And I'm like, how come we don't talk about fasting anymore or watchful prayer or, or you know, the, the, 
the um, what do they call it? The, the 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 daily offices. I mean, these are things that have been done for thousands of years, right? And I'm getting into that with you know a little bit with the Book of Prayer and those kind of things. And I began to reflect on that personally. And Dallas Willer in the Spirit of the Disciplines really hits on this, where he talks about our walk, or even our spirituality and our our experience of God is we experience that through body, right? The reason we, we go into solitude and silence is to rein in, right? To rein in uh, the mind, right? The, the Trinity we talked about, Chris. The mind, the soul, the body, right? The, the, it's one. It's a holistic thing. And the way we rein in ourselves spiritually is to quiet our tongue. Quiet the mind. Don't feed it. Feed it with nothing. No radio, no TV, no anything for a period of time. Well, you want to enter a dark night, right? I mean, that'll be the... Sometimes silence is so dark that it's frightening. I mean, we've talked about it. It gives me the chills just thinking about it sometimes. It can be that frightening. Walking into, you know, fasting. You know, just a simple thing, Chris, right? That, that we've kind of... Why, why fast? Well, because it's training the body, soul, and spirit together on... I don't need to depend on these things completely, right? I can't live by bread alone, right? That's such a deep thing that Jesus said, but yet, isn't it kind of simple, right? Mm -hmm. We all know that bread alone, we don't feel satisfied, right? Or in money, doing our things. I mean, people, the world will tell you that. It just doesn't add up at the end. It's a way of practicing and embodying that. I think that's the biggest thing because I attach that to the story. Yes, we're part of the story. God is saving me. But guess what? He's remaking me and the body of believers, right, worldwide. And he's remaking his creation, which he said was very good, right? We're part of this grand thing. Being remade, resurrected, renewed. And that is a powerful thing. I believe that that shifts the whole orientation of your life. It really does. It, it shifts you toward a kingdom arc which I would argue, and this is a word I'm stealing from Paul Gold here, is makes your faith desirable to the world. Okay? It makes it desirable. It tells the story, right? It affirms what God said was good, right? And, and even in the fall, it's not like God said, oh, you know, that was good, but you really completely ruined it. You know, it's like, no, you're not going to ruin it. You know, I'm going to save this. You know, I'm going to redeem the image of God in you and all, all these kind of things. But I, I think that's powerful. And I've been trying to walk into that right now um, in, in a way of where I can witness to that as I experience that. Because that's been a shift for me. I've just adopted what I've heard. I've, I've been a product of my time. That's the message I heard, you know, the, the, the kind of a truncated gospel message in a way. And I think it's powerful go to find out more about you and the work that you're doing and if they want to support you in it so the main place you can go is you you can find at agmd.org if you go to that site you search for my name kevin folk you'll find uh information our missions page about us our ministry some some basic information you can contact me through there and kind of see a little bit about our heart um and the the work we do in christian education in a mission uh, missions context so that's the best place and also really i'll make an appeal to you if, if you've heard some of the books we've mentioned and some other books I'm sure that Chris and Josh have mentioned, I encourage you, begin to begin to approach some of those books and they're good reading, right? Mm-hmm. They, these, are, these are books that are uh, incredibly written so that you can consume it almost like a novel. And if you don't want to start with that stuff, no problem. Let me give you the be- one of the best places you can start where Chris messed me up some years ago, really messed me up. He said, hey, Kev, you ever heard of Ted Decker and the Circle Series? And I was like, no. He's like, why don't you read this? And I remember finishing that down in Jamaica while I was teaching. And I, I, I literally one night could not sleep until I had finished that. So that's a good place to start too. Start with the Circle series, the three. And if you just want to read a novel and you just want to consume something in the summer, and if not, jump into some stuff from Goldsworthy and Goheen. And we'll have links to everything down in the show notes as always. So um, if you want to click on uh, that page that Kevin mentioned and go and support them, that would be wonderful. But definitely, definitely go check out these books because they will change your life. They will. Kevin, thanks so much for being on the podcast with us today. This has been Thank you. a wonderful conversation. We'll have to do it again sometime because there's still so much that we can talk about 
And uh, again, as we continue to learn and grow in Christ, we continue the discipleship process and being made into his image. So thank you so much. How can you create a lifestyle of discipleship? Most Christians think discipleship is a program or a few practices thrown in at the beginning or end of the day. But we want to help you create a lifestyle where walking with Jesus throughout the day is not only possible, but natural. And we have a tool that's going to help you do just that. It's called the Daily Growth Journal. It's a guided journal that's going to help you become secure in your identity with God and authentically walk with Him in your daily life. Growing daily in your walk with Christ is possible if you cultivate a lifestyle of discipleship. And the Daily Growth Journal will help you do just that. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Daily Growth Discipleship Podcast. To find out more about Kevin's work, check out agmd.org slash you slash folk. If you like what you've heard this week, give us a review on Apple Podcasts or the podcast player you use. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to stay up to date on everything happening at Daily Growth Discipleship, go to dailygrowthdiscipleship.com and subscribe for free. You can also subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Oh,